Jason, this is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston Station, we are ready for the event. Station, Houston Station, Station, we're ready for the event. Station, this is Houston ACR. Please stand by for the YouTube questions. Hi, this is Ben Dolan from, from Milltown School in New Jersey. How will my helium face um, flow to your space station? Well, that's an interesting question. Unfortunately, we don't have handy any helium right now, but it turns out we do have a balloon, and we can demonstrate how a balloon, when pressurized, behaves in the microgravity environment of the International Space Station. We had never tried this before, so here it goes. And we don't have a fish balloon, but this balloon looks a lot like a clown fish, a long-nosed clown fish. I think it's close enough. See, he's got the clown fish tail, and the long nose, and it actually looks like a clownfish, and, it, and it's blown up with air, and we'll, we'll see what happens. Let me release his nose here. <laughs> so if you release a balloon, that's what it does in microgravity. It's very similar to what it would do on planet Earth. If you have a helium-filled balloon in the atmosphere that, you're, that, uh, that you have in your house, for example, that, that balloon is going to float. Here in Space Station, we believe it would not do that. Hello, my name is James Morris. I live in Lancashire, England, and I want to know how do you sleep? That's a good question. If, if you mean how well do we sleep, I would say the answer is very well. I think we sleep as well here as you do on planet Earth. Uh, we all have a small, each of us have our own small sleep station, we call it. It's like a bedroom, but it's a very small bedroom, about the size of, a, of an old-fashioned style phone booth. But it's big enough for our sleeping bag. It's big enough for a computer. Uh, it's big enough for pictures from friends and family. And uh, we basically have that sleeping bag tied to the, uh, to the wall or maybe hanging from the ceiling. And we essentially float in that sleeping bag. And it's like sleeping on the softest bed you could imagine. Hi, my name's George Christensen. I'm living in Lincolnshire in the UK. Uh, my question is, can astronauts on the space station see changes happening on the Earth below? And what kind of processes can you see happening on the, on the planet when you look at it from up in space? You can certainly see seasonal changes on Earth. What's most striking from our mission here during the wintertime is watching the snow season in the northern hemisphere change into spring and you can see ice packs melting you can see the snow melting you can see a late spring snowstorm that might blanket everything so certainly seasonal changes you can see uh, on a wide scale uh, from space uh, uh, other changes for, for example geologic changes you really can't see but you can see the effects of geology because you can see things on the length scale of half a continent so you can see synclines and you can see see effects of glaciation you can see all kinds of of natural phenomenology that you read about in geology books on the length scale of half a continent Hello, Commander Burbank and the rest of the crew on the International Space Station. I'm Oliver from Village Elementary School in Skillman, New Jersey, USA. What is a typical day in a space station like from eating, bathing, and working? Oliver, hello. Um, the interesting thing about living on board the International Space Station is a typical day really doesn't happen up here. Every day is something very different. 
the biggest thing that we do is we spend a lot of time doing science, but we get up early in the morning, uh, about six o'clock in the morning, we get a chance to, uh, to clean up. We, do, we don't have a shower on board space station, so we can't shower or bathe like you would ordinarily on uh, planet Earth at your home, for example. Uh, but, uh, but we have, we can um, essentially take a sponge bath. So we have lots of towels, we have uh, special soap that, uh, that doesn't require a lot of uh, water because water is a precious commodity on space station. And uh, we can get very clean that way. And uh, we'll have breakfast, we'll read the, uh, the morning mail, if you will, the, uh, the various uh, activities that the ground uh, has set up for us to do during that day. And these are control centers all around the world. And then we'll set about our work. And our work may be doing science experiments. It may be getting ready to do a spacewalk, as will happen in a, in a week. Uh, it'll may be, it may be uh, getting ready to receive a visiting vehicle. Um, and uh, it may be working on the International Space Station, fixing systems, working and uh, tuning them up so they, they, they work better. Do you get bored of microgravity? Do bored? Does it get boring to play with your food while it flies around? And does it get boring to fly around yourself? Like, um, or, or does it just get normal? like everyday life, casual, don't really notice it that much or, or what. And uh, what's irritating about it apart from showering? Uh, uh, there's never a boring moment on Space Station. And uh, just as an example, while we're, we're sitting here or floating here, uh, talking to you guys, I had this balloon that uh, I used for demonstration earlier, and uh, hold the mic, and the, the thought occurred to me, what happens if I rub it on my head? And can I do static electricity? Look at that, huh? And, and then I can rub it on here, and I can stick it to me. So how could you be bored when everything you look at is new and wonderful and there's all kinds of amazing physics and chemistry that are just waiting to be demonstrated here that you can't see when you're living on Earth. Hi, Commander Burbank. My name is Ahan from Village Elementary School in Skillman, New Jersey. What dangers do you face from solar wind? That's a great question. It's one of the biggest concerns, I think, that uh, that spaceflight presents for uh, for at least journeys beyond low Earth uh, orbit. And uh, right now, low Earth orbit is where space station is located. And most of the protection that uh, that all of us enjoy on planet Earth is actually for, from radiation is actually provided by the Earth's uh, magnetosphere. So charged particles, uh, um, be they from the sun, be they from uh, galactic cosmic rays, uh, most of those, or a good deal of those, unless it's a very energetic event, get captured by the magnetic field of the Earth and uh, those charged particles run relatively harmlessly to us back and forth from the north to the south pole. And they make the spectacular auroras that uh, we get to see if we're lucky to live in extreme northern or southern uh, latitudes. And uh, if we're lucky enough to live on board International Space Station, we get to see those almost every day. If there's a really energetic solar uh, event, that can present a problem for us here on board Space Station. And uh, up till now, in, uh, in the 10 years plus that Space Station's been here, there hasn't been one that has presented a big enough danger for the crew. We have safer places to be on board Space Station should we need to. And uh, there's a whole suite of satellites that observe the sun. And uh, when, there, when there is a charged particle event or a coronal mass ejection, uh, we've got scientists that can track that. The stuff that's particularly dangerous actually gives us a couple days notice, typically, uh, so we can shelter. If we want to leave low Earth orbit, though, and if we want to go to the moon, or if we want to go on to Mars and, uh, and uh, further destinations, then we leave the protection of the Earth's magnetic field. So uh, we need to be thinking very carefully about that, how to protect crews, and it's a very, very challenging thing. Hi, I'm Jeff from Italy. Uh, have noticed that you always look good in space. My question is uh, how you cut uh, your hair or shave uh, in the space mornings? Uh, uh, we, we shave pretty much like you do on the ground. I use a, 
I, I use an electric razor and all the whiskers get caught in a razor. And then once a week when I'm doing normal vacuuming, I vacuum my razor out. Cause you can imagine you don't want to open your razor up in a weightless environment. Cause all those nasty little whiskers that go floating out and, 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 and get in the air. So I open my razor very carefully in front of the vacuum cleaner and all the whiskers get sucked out in the vacuum cleaner. And, uh, and then my razor is ready for another week. Uh, hair cutting is a bigger challenge. Uh, we've got, we have uh, hair clippers here and uh, we don't have a hairdresser or a barber though. So all of us that may be professional astronauts or pilots or engineers or scientists are anything but professional um, hairdressers. So uh, the first couple of haircuts that we subject each other to typically aren't um, all great and they certainly aren't professional looking. And uh, we learn as we go. We learn during the uh, six months or so we're on board space station. And um, that's really not a big challenge for us. Um, and uh, it's one of uh, the interesting aspects of living in space. Good evening to Expedition 30 crew members. My name is Clinton Everly. I'm from Durban, South Africa. My question is, what do you gentlemen do in your own free time? When you have time off, you're not working on experiments or concentrating on maintenance on the space station. What do you do in space to take time out? I look forward to your answer. Keep safe, keep well, good evening. Uh, there's uh, uh, all kinds of things we could do in our off-duty time. Uh, one is take pictures out the window of Earth and of space, and 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 it's the the views are amazing. Another thing you can do, and and it, it's because I'm I'm a, a scientist by training, and and I live and breathe science, and it's such an amazing environment up here. Uh, I like to do little educational based science demonstrations during my spare time and just as an example uh, I've got this balloon here and in the course of of this conference I'm thinking of some ideas I might be able to use this balloon for so either tonight my spare time maybe tomorrow my spare time I'm going to use this balloon and do some uh, interesting little science demonstrations and I'll film it in a video and maybe uh, uh, give me a, a week or so and I'll end up downlinking it and uh, everyone can see uh, what I did in my spare time with this balloon. How does it feel to breathe the air inside the station? Does it feel fresh? or does it feel stuffy so that you want to go and open a window? Well, unfortunately, we, we don't have an opportunity to open the windows, or if we do, we got to be dressed for the occasion here. Um, the air on board space station is cleaned and filtered and scrubbed to carbon dioxide. Um, it's still a, it's a big challenge. There's a huge volume and a, and a massive amount of air that needs to be moved around here, and it needs to be strained and filtered through the filtration system. Um, and it's, it's processed, like I say, to remove primarily carbon dioxide, but there's also other trace contaminants that could be here as well. We've got a lot of uh, systems that monitor all those and monitor the condition of the atmosphere. To me, to all of us, I think, on board here, it, uh, it smells and, and feels a lot like it would inside of a building on planet Earth, uh, a building that's air conditioned and, uh, and relatively comfortable. Some of the things you miss, though, you don't smell mown grass, for example. You don't smell uh, flowers. You don't smell uh, pine trees. You don't smell the kinds of things that are that are part and parcel with uh, living on planet Earth. And I think after a while you kind of miss that a little bit. But the quality of the air here, I think, is very good. Station, this is Houston ACR. Thank you. That concludes the event. Thank you, Station and YouTube participants. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications. Okay, copy. Thanks very much.